Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for providing this awesome opportunity to talk to the world about the research we're doing in cheese, rind, and microbiomes. I know many of us are looking for a pleasant distraction these days, so I hope you're all well, and I hope you're ready to learn a little bit about cheese. Um, and thank you to Rob Dunn as well as Michelle for organizing um, this awesome set of talks in this fermentology series. So I am a professor in the Department of Biology at Tufts University, uh, which is in Medford, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And I throw up my Twitter handle there. In case you have any questions after the talk, you can go ahead and tweet at me and I'll try to answer questions you may have had that I don't answer in this talk. So what I'm gonna be talking today uh, about today is the microbiome. And of course, this is a term that many of you are hearing these days, um, particularly now during a pandemic, but. Um, in general, over the last 10 or 15 years, it's a term that we hear more and more about. And the microbiome is simply the collection of microbes living in a particular environment. Um, so everything really, at the end of the day, has a microbiome. Uh, human bodies have a microbiome. Soil has a microbiome. My cat has a microbiome because she is an organism. And on her, she has a bunch of microbes living on her surface of her fur, living inside of her belly, living on her paws. And microbiomes contain many types of microbes. So it's often bacteria that we're thinking about, but there are also fungi like yeast and molds, as well as viruses, of course, which we know a lot about these days. And microbiomes are everywhere, really. Everything has a, a microbiome. And the reason I'm talking about microbiomes today is there's some really big challenges in terms of studying microbiomes, in terms of understanding what this collection of microbes really is. What is this community? And one of the really big questions that's still uh, relatively open is what generates microbiome diversity? So why do we see different types of communities of microbes in different habitats? And here's an awesome example from the human microbiome. What we're looking at here are data from uh, samples, swabs um, from a human body, on the, mostly on the surface, everywhere from your nose all the way down to your toes. And what you can see in those little pie charts on this graph, um, each of these different pie charts has different colors in them. And those colors represent different types of bacteria that were studied in, in this particular example. And what you can see is, for example, up in your nose, you have these blue colors, which represent various actinobacteria. And between your toes, you have a very different community of bacteria, a very different type of microbial community present. And so one really big question is why? Right, what's creating that diversity? And, and this is still a relatively unresolved question in, in the science of microbiomes. Another really big challenge for microbiologists who are studying microbiomes is trying to understand the parts in a microbiome. So those would be the microbial species, the yeast, the fungi, the bacteria, the molds, the viruses, all these different types of microbes. Um, what are the parts? And also, how do those parts fit together? And what I like to think about here is an assembly line. When you're building a car, there are particular ways that the wheel has to interact with the axle, which has to interact with the steering wheel, for example. And so what we're trying to do in the world of the microbiome and studying microbiomes is understanding are there particular parts in a microbiome that you need to accomplish a function? And then how do those parts fit together? How do those microbes, how do those cells interact with each other and communicate in some ways with each other? Just like the wheel of your car is interacting with the axle of your car. Another really big challenge in studying microbiomes is that so much of what we know about microbes comes from a history of microbiology where we studied microbes all by themselves in a petri dish. Right, so much of the science of microbiology, and it's been amazing, fantastic science, I'm not putting it down in any way, um, but it's come from monoculture, studying just a single organism living all by itself. But as I've just been telling you, microbes live in these very complicated systems where there's many different neighboring species that could potentially help them or hurt them, or maybe not interact with them at all. And so what we're trying to do when we're studying microbiomes is understand those microbial interactions. So what we do in my lab, the way we kind of address these really big questions about diversity and interactions in microbiomes is we use fermented foods almost like a lab rat. So the reason we do this is that um, most microbiomes are very complex. They have hundreds or thousands of species in them. 
And they're being worked on by many scientists, but they're relatively challenging puzzles to put together and take apart. Um, and so the great thing about fermented foods is they're relatively simple systems. Um, for hundreds of years, people have been taking microbes, mixing them with raw materials like cabbage if you're making a fermented vegetable or tea if you're making kombucha. And through things like salt, heat, and time, we've been able to come out on the other side of this with these microbial communities that live in fermented foods. And what's really awesome from a scientific perspective is that these are being made all over the world. They're almost like little Petri dishes that people are putting out for us to study, like little islands of biodiversity. They're reproducible. They generally make the same thing over and over again. And that's such a fascinating um, ecological problem to solve. Um, they're easy to grow. So most of the microbes in fermented foods, we can coax them to grow in a Petri dish in the lab. That's not necessarily true in a lot of other systems like your gut or uh, in soil where many microbes are really hard to grow in the lab. And finally, my last point there is tractable complexity. And what I mean by that is they're relatively simple systems. There's usually one, two, three, maybe up to 20 different species of microbes living in a fermented food as opposed to your gut where there may be thousands of species. So what we can do is use fermented foods as a, a simple lab rat to study and understand microbiomes and then take it back out into the world and maybe learn general principles in more complex systems. What I'm talking about today in this short talk would be surface ripened cheeses. This is really where a lot of the research in my lab has been focused. There's other systems we're working on I'll briefly mention later. And when I say surface ripened cheese, what I'm talking about is not that plastic wrap cheddar that you see in the supermarket. What we're talking about here are cheeses that are furry and wrinkly and spotted and sort of funky sometimes, right? Um, these are cheeses where you grow a microbial community. You grow a microbiome on the surface of the cheese. And over time, that microbial community decomposes that cheese, right? That curd, that solidified milk, it's slowly from the outside rotting that cheese and kicking off all these delicious flavors that we enjoy as uh, consumers of cheese. You get buttery flavors, fruity flavors, and a lot of funky cabbage flavors sometimes as well. And just a quick review of how cheese is made to understand where these rinds come from. You have to get milk, of course. Um, you make curds, so you actually solidify that milk through a whole other fermentation process that I'm not gonna talk about today. You drain those curds to make a shape, some kind of circle or square, you add salt. And then what we're most excited about um, in terms of today's talk is understanding affinage, the aging step. We're really excited about understanding how the microbial community grows on the surface as the cheese is aged over time. Again, that's the rind. And so these rinds, these microbial communities on the surface of the cheese develop in aging facilities all over the world. This is one of my favorite places to go, Jasper Hill Farms up in Vermont. But this is a, you know, a really high tech example would be the Vermont example. Over here on the right, we see a very low tech uh, cave aging facility in France where a uh, particular cheesemaker is making a cheese in a very traditional way. And that fuzz you see there is, is good. That's the rind. Those are the fungi that he's trying to grow to make that rind. And this is sort of looking at different stages of cheese rind development. This is fresh cheese. This is sort of middle aged cheese. And this would be cheese about ready to be shipped out to the consumer. And you can see as that pigmentation develops on the surface of the cheese, that's the rind that's growing on the cheese. Now, there are three different types of microbial cheese rinds. This is my one sort of dinner party trick. This is a slide to remember at your um, next time you're hanging out with people and you can bring cheese. Uh, the first would be a bloomy rind cheese. And these are called bloomy rind cheese because they bloom with a white fungus during the aging process. And these tend to be heavily inoculated with starter cultures that the cheesemaker can buy and add to the cheese. The second type of cheese are uh, washed rind cheeses. And these are those really stinky, funky things like Taleggio and Limburger. They grow that stinky, sticky, sorry, and stinky, um, uh, what, uh, usually orange or sometimes red or pink rinds on their surface. And they're washed with a brine solution during the aging process. And what that does is it promotes the formation of this particular rind. And third, we have a natural rind cheese. And natural rind cheeses, these are cheeses where we don't really do a whole lot. We just let 
a microbial community established. We don't inoculate it very much. We don't manipulate it very much. It's kind of like the old growth forests of cheese rinds. And what you can see on the right here are pictures of the microbial communities played out in the lab. And you can see just by looking at the shapes and the colonies that are growing that you get very different types of microbial communities in these three different types of rinds. So one of the things we've been doing is just sequencing the microbiome of these cheese rinds. We first go out and say, what are the patterns of diversity across cheese rinds to understand um, just who's out there, what microbes are out there. And the way we do that is sort of like um, microbial CSI, um, you know, when they go out and do a crime scene investigation. But in this case, we're looking at what microbes are there, not what criminal was at a particular site. And so what we do is we extract DNA from the cheese rind, we go in and find particular DNA regions that are useful for identifying microbes. We sequence that DNA and we match it to databases. So extract, amplify, sequence, and match. And this is pretty old data at this point, but it's really been the foundation for most of our work. And this is uh, our big survey of 137 different cheeses made throughout the United States as well as Europe. And what I'm showing you here, each of these different columns in this graph represents a single cheese that we sampled. There's multiple wheels that have been averaged together in that single cheese. And what you can see on the top here, these are data for bacteria. And on the bottom, we have data for fungi. And each of the different colors here represents either different bacterial or fungal genera. So kind of like maples, oaks, and pines for plants, but we're talking about uh, for bacteria and fungi here. And really all I want you to take away from this graph is as you scan across all those different cheeses, all those different columns, you see a lot of variation in the overall composition of the cheese rind microbial communities. There's a lot of diversity out there and I won't get into it today, but some of that's based on the practices that the cheesemaker use. Some of it's based on uh, raw versus pasteurized. There's a lot of interesting stuff that we unpacked in that study. But what I really wanna to get to today is thinking about how those communities come together. How are they built in this idea of microbial war and peace that I brought up in the title? So microbial community assembly refers to the microbes coming together to this particular habitat, and in, in this case, it's cheese, and growing together to form a community. And what we've been able to see in a cheese that we've studied a long period of time is a succession. This is something you hear a lot about in ecology. We're in the early stages of the rind development. We get a particular type of microbe, these bacteria called Staphylococcus. These are not Staph aureus, these are other Staph species. Uh, then we get some yeast coming in. And then later on, we get um, actinobacteria and filamentous fungi or mold. So we see this clear temporal progression as the cheese rind develops over time. And so what we've been trying to do is use this cheese rind system to understand that process of, process of assembly. What's actually controlling that? And if we can understand that, it goes back to the questions I introduced at the very beginning of the talk, then we can understand what drives diversity more generally in microbiomes, right? We could understand maybe some of the variation we see in the human microbiome. So the first thing we think about is what are the parts available to build a microbiome? And that's the process of dispersal. What I mean there is that there's a certain set of microbial species in a particular place and only some of those, in this case, it's the orange, blue, and green bacteria, get to the cheese rind. They actually have to get there physically and move there, right? That's step one. The second way we think about cheese rinds building, uh, uh, coming together in this assembly process is how they fit together. How do those microbial parts, the, the microbial species, interact? Uh, and apologies, there should be a question mark there. Ooh, typo. Uh, and then third, um, how do microbiomes change over time? And this is the idea that once a community actually comes together and is established, if it's continuously being grown in an environment as you see in kombucha, as you see in sourdough, and you sometimes see in cheese, those microbes could evolve. Mutations can pop up in their genomes and you can actually see new genome genetic types, but you can also see new phenotypes. And so these are the three things we talk about. And most of what I'll be talking about today is how do those microbial parts fit together, the interactions. So we've been thinking about microbial interactions in cheese rinds. And most of what we've been thinking about is how fungi interact with bacteria in their environment. And so uh, what I'll be telling you about today is a very short story about um, how bacteria can use 
molds the filamentous fungi and cheese as a superhighway. It's a story we published a couple of years ago, but I think it most clearly illustrates the importance of the interactions in this particular system. And so some bacteria, including those that can live on cheeses, are motile is what we call it. So these would be bacteria that have little tails called flagella, and they use these tails to swim around um, in liquid environments, or sometimes they can even use them to spread across the surface of, an, of a thing like a cheese. And one of the things we got really interested in in the cheese rind system is how do these bacteria that can swim around that can actually actively move themselves on surfaces, how might that motility work if there are other microbes present? And what we happen to do is stumble across something really awesome, uh, really cool. So we, we noticed this weird morphotype in a particular cheese where we plated it out. Um, and when we zoomed in really closely, what we noticed is that there were fungal hyphae. So these are the little filaments that make up uh, a mold. And around those filaments, we noticed that there are these bacteria. And I'm pretty sure that um, in Zoom, you can actually play videos, which is totally fine. I have a link to the video. You can check it out later on YouTube. What we found is that these bacteria were actually swimming along the fungal hyphae. They were actually quickly moving around the tips of the fungus, almost like a swarm of bees moving around a tree. And the bacterium here is a bacterium called Stratia, and the fungus is a, is a fungus called Mucor. And what we notice is if you put the bacteria in the middle of a Petri dish, and then you add the fungus, if you add this filamentous fungus, the mold, the fungus acts like a superhighway. It actually creates this filamentous network and then the bacteria are able to hop on that network and swim around it and move around it. And you can see that very clearly here where in the middle of this plate, we have the bacterium growing by itself. And when we spike in the fungus, when we add that filamentous fungus network, you can see the white has moved across the Petri dish, which is about this big, um, much further than when it was by itself. And we call that um, dispersal facilitation. It's actually the fungus is helping the bacteria move across the surface. And this is in a petri dish, but we've actually shown the same thing can happen on the surface of a, a cheese-like uh, medium. And what we notice is that not all bacteria use fungal superhighways, right? So some bacteria like these proteobacteria can move very far. So the, if you're on this particular graph, if the bar is really high and to the right of the line, which is zero, that means that these bacteria were able to spread really far on the fungal hyphae. They're, they're using the highway versus these other bacteria, they don't have a, a pass to use the fungal superhighway, if you will. And so they don't move on those fungal networks. And so what was interesting to us is we thought, well, if you add in the fungal networks in a community, when you have many species living together, you might expect that you can then promote the growth of these bacteria, right? The ones that can use the superhighway will be able to get around the cheese more quickly and become the dominant species. And so we did an experiment where we mixed together four different bacteria here. Um, I'm showing you the four bacteria include one in yellowish orange here called Serratia that uses the fungal superhighway and then three bacteria that don't use the fungal superhighway. And so we mix them together equally, added them to our cheese, our lab cheese. And then after a couple of weeks of aging, this is what the community looked like. Each of these is a replicate cheese right here. There's five replicates. And what you find is that the serratia uh, takes over pretty nice in the community, but it's not dominant. The other things are still around. If you spike in the fungal network, if you give the super highway to this bacterial community, it does indeed favor the serratia. It allows it to get everywhere across the surface of the cheese and really take over the community. And this is really fascinating because this is a mechanism of interactions between microbes facilitation, whereby uh, that facilitation can change the entire community composition. So we went on to do some genetic experiments, which I won't go into great detail, but we were trying to figure out like, what is it about the bacterium? What genes are controlling this cool phenomenon? And it turns out that it's flagella. <laughs> you need to have functional flagella. You need to have those little bacterial tails to be able to swim along the fungal hyphae and migrate throughout the cheese on these fungal superhighways. Um, and this is just an example of a gene in the genome where we broke it with a genetic screen and it's to make flagella. And when we broke it, those uh, bacteria were no longer able to grow. So this is just one example of how fungi and bacteria work together on a wheel of aging cheese.
and allow the bacteria to uh, grow much better. And in general, we think it's a cool example of how pairwise interactions, how microbes coming together can actually change the entire community. And one thing this is important to think about is that there are some pathogens like Listeria, uh, which can be problems in cheese making. And maybe these fungal superhighways, uh, if you have a pathogen that's motile with these flagella, uh, maybe they can use them to get around. That could actually be a problem. So that's just one example. We've been really exploring microbial interactions beyond just dispersal facilitation. We have a really cool example of a penicillium mold, uh, a relative of the mold that brought us penicillin that kills Rhine bacteria through antibiotics, it completely wipes them out. That's what you're seeing in this picture here. Here's some happy bacteria. And as they get close to the fungus, boom, being wiped out. And that's some ongoing work with uh, Nancy Keller. Another experiment in the lab, a set of experiments in the lab is looking at how bacteria respond to the aromas of cheese. Those aromas are breakdown products of the cheese, the, the microbe breaking down that, that cheese curd. And what we're finding is that some of those volatiles can be used by bacteria and stimulate them to grow. So long distance communication um, through the smells of your cheese. We also have examples um, of fungi providing nutrients for bacteria. And we also have other examples where they're really fighting for scarce resources like metals in the cheese. So it really is microbial war and, and peace in that, in that rind. So the next time you go to a cheese shop, it's not just a static wheel of cheese, it's this dynamic microbial community that's right there before your eyes. Um, I just wanna point out that we've been working on surface ripened cheeses, but we have a lot of other projects in the lab looking at sauerkraut and kimchi, a project looking at kombucha and interactions in that system, and a really incredible collaboration with Rob Dunn, Noah Fire, and, and many other folks um, looking at the microbial diversity of sourdough starters. And we're using the same approach, trying to understand how dispersal, interactions, and diversification come together to build a microbiome, to learn general design principles that we might be able to use to manipulate microbial communities. Oh, and by the way, we're studying cheese, right? So we're doing this for basic science, but we can solve problems. Not every batch of cheese turns out great. You don't really see those batches of cheese because they would never go to the supermarket or to your local cheese shop. Um, but some cheeses just get weird, funky defects, um, like this really incredible purple rind that formed on this cheese. And so what we can do is use our understanding of microbiome assembly to address some of these cheese problems. It's one of the, my favorite aspects of this job is helping cheesemakers uh, understand the microbial dynamics that are really important for the quality and aesthetics of their products. Uh, just a quick shout out for our website, microbialfoods.org, where we digest the science of fermented foods. Um, we have a lot of great articles that you might be interested in uh, learning more about um, how organic versus conventional agriculture affects sourdough microbiomes, or you can download a, a posters for uh, fermented foods like cheese and salami. And you can also check out uh, various examples of the media that we've worked on um, to get out the word about the amazing microbial communities in cheese. So thank you all so much for coming out today to listen to this uh, story about microbial interactions and cheese rinds. And like I said, there's so much more. There's so many awesome people that you can see here that have helped out with various aspects of these fermented food systems. And I'll also give a great shout out to Tufts and the USDA, the National Science Foundation uh, for funding this work and supporting our work on fermented food microbiomes. So thank you all so much. Uh, this has been a treat. Thank you so much, Ben. That's, uh, I'm clapping on behalf of the 170 or so people we have watching at the moment. So thank right. you so much for lending Absolutely. your expertise. Great. Um, we have just a few quick plugs as I always do. Uh, next week, fermenting for the zombie apocalypse with Athena Actipus, who's actually watching on YouTube right now. Um, <laughs> so make sure you tune in next week for her talk as well. Um, and keep a lookout Tomorrow, I'm probably gonna send out a survey asking for your feedback on the series and if this time still works really well for you or if you think maybe later or earlier. I know some of our international people might have a different or maybe strong feelings about the timing of our talk. So please uh, let that be known in the survey I'll send out tomorrow. And again, for one last time from everybody that's watching, Ben, thank you so much for your talk today.
Um, we already great. have so much knowledge for our dinner parties and now we get to talk <laughs> about cheese too. So thank great. you for that. Thank you. This has been fun. Great guys.